What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb who is the great I am. While millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And through eternity, I'll sing. Love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking... Good morning, Sovereign Grace Church. Good to see everybody out today. And uh, welcome to those that are joining us on the internet. And uh, uh, just want to... Uh, Ryan, people, of the wonderful event that will happen after church today, the baptism of Romy, and uh, Bill, did you have any other announcements other than that one? No? Okay, yeah. and uh, there is a, yeah, yes? Um, I think I was telling you guys yesterday morning, the Makarovs, the Russian pastor, so I did go there last night, so we were thinking the 25th of uh, June, so about two weeks to have that, that the movie on the insanity of God that Ruthie mentioned that we're going to show it here. So. Can be here. Yeah, so Saturday the 25th. Oh, Saturday the 25th, okay. Maybe five or so, I don't know what time, six. Five, day five. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you say where the baptism is? Um, for the park. Florida Park. Okay. I'm having another senior moment. <laughs> Which park is that? Florida Park. <laughs> the one where you know, normally do do it down here on the right Bay Shore Drive. The bridge going to Eglin. Turn left immediately afterwards, and it'll take you right to it. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Anybody have any questions about that? Be sure to check with us after church today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we're reminded of Zechariah 2.13, all flesh be silent before Jehovah, for he's roused up from his holy habitation. Take a moment to set aside those things that would distract us and uh, offer up this uh, time in prayer. Psalm 59, 16, and 17. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will cry aloud of your mercy in the morning, for you've been my strong tower and my hiding place in the day of my trouble. To you, O my strength, I will sing compositions, for God is my strong tower, the God of my mercy. Let's begin our worship service this morning with our choral call to worship, uh, standing together and uh, praising Him with the song, Praise Him. Worship, worship uh, number 11. Worship song number 11 in the blue psalter there. Let's uh, call on God and ask his blessing on our worship. Oh God, you are good. We do praise you. You have uh, put a song in our hearts of praise to our God. You have lifted our spirits because we who were bound for destruction have been brought into all the blessings of life, into your very family, adopted through your only begotten Christ with full privileges, co-sharers, co-inheritors with him. Lord, what generosity. We can't, can't really uh, comprehend, but we, we fear, Lord, that uh, we are constantly falling short, being ungrateful. And so, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Give us that measure today with which we may uh, give you all that we have and that you would expand our hearts, that we would give you, uh, Lord, all that uh, we should. And we thank you. We ask, Lord, that you bless your worship everywhere here on earth today that joins the praises in heaven, saying, Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. 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 <coughs> now, uh, 
Uh, remain standing as we uh, sing our uh, hymn, Christ Shall Have Dominion, number 439 in the red hymnal, 439. Psalm 78 there, right? Uh, selected verses from there. All right. Let's now turn in our uh, booth altar to uh, the golden pages up front, and we'll be uh, uh, reciting uh, selection number 7 and number 23. 7 and 23, 7 out of 1 Corinthians. Uh, 15 verses 1 through 4. Uh, believing in our hearts and confessing together God's Word. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Turning now to selection number 23 out of Revelations, again all together. You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, and who was, and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Amen. So remain standing. We're going to sing Psalm number 133 this morning, the Blue Psalter. Psalm number say amen. amen praise the lord and yeah you may be seated sorry <clears throat> Psalm 75 and verse 1 says, We have given thanks to you, O God. We have given thanks. For your name is near, your wonderful works have been told. And indeed, his wonderful works have been uh, told very fully in the coming and the sacrifice of Christ, haven't they? Let's praise him. Uh, Father, we... Uh, we acknowledge you as the one who has given us birth, that you have sent your spirit to make us alive. You who originally made man alive, a, a living being, you have breathed anew into us, for we were dead spiritually. And our father spiritually was Satan, for we, like him, did as we pleased and sought to honor ourselves or sought the honor of the creature rather than the creator. And so we thank you that you 
by your grace in order to uh, magnify your mercy have uh, shown mercy upon us who deserve no mercy and you have brought us in fully and for that we praise you and we ask now that you hear us from your throne in heaven that you would uh, look kindly upon us and our prayer that you would send your spirit to help us to pray to remember your promises and your warnings so that what we are saying to you is simply an answer back that we have learned wisdom to hear your voice first and so we ask as jesus taught us that your name be set apart be sanctified and made holy that you would be of prime importance to us and as peter said that we would sanctify the lord god in our hearts and we know if we do this that we will always be ready to give a defense to any man concerning the, the hope that is within us, should they ask. And we pray, Lord, we will seek opportunities to tell, because uh, we do count this good news. But again, we fear, O oh God, not, not good enough. It is not on the tip of our tongues. We are afraid of the response of men. Lord, take this fear away from us. Let us uh, operate in your name, on your authority, in your power. And so cause your kingdom to come so that the one who is king, to whom all authority has been given in heaven and on earth, so that he may receive the praise. And we long for his coming to take possession of what is his. We uh, thank you for the power that you give us now to walk in his ways the kingdom of God that is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Bless us, Lord, to um, seek to dwell in, in the Spirit and that we will be filled in the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and psalming in our hearts to you. Lord, teach us your ways, teach us your will, teach us your commands so that your will will be done here on earth the way it is done in heaven by your angels. And so teach us, Lord, from your word today, uh, every day, that we will delight to walk in your ways, seeing that uh, it is all summarized in love, in loving you and loving one another. And yet this is exactly what we uh, didn't do before. We only uh, chiefly loved ourselves or we loved others who pleased us in some way. Thank you, Lord, for showing us the better kind of love. And we, we pray, Lord, that we would operate according to it and that we would be those who give as you have given. We pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayer for the nations, their peoples, and their leaders, that we, your people, may uh, lead peaceful and quiet lives in all reverence and somberness. We pray, O oh God, do not deliver us into the hands of those who hate your gospel and who uh, see that they are in opposition to you and must uh, quiet your people and your ways. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bring down leaders that have already succeeded in doing this and who are in prison your people freely. We pray, Lord, that you would bring down Xi Jinping and other leaders in the world who uh, harm your people. And we pray for your people. You've told us to remember those in prison like we were there with them. And so, Lord, help us as we pause to do that together. Lord God, we pray that we will be counted uh, worthy to be named among them, that uh, we would, would not count our reputation and ourselves um, as something dear to us, but that your name would come first rather than ours. 
that you would make us your messengers and that you would send us forth as you have sent those forth who have gone to help whole people groups who needed your word. Thank you for all those we may help, Lord, as a, as a church. We pray, Lord, for the Valandries and for the Youngers, the Melcheskis. We pray that you will bless Ruthie starting up. We pray that you will bless the Hinses, the Wilds, Lord, uh, we thank you for the privilege of participating with them. We pray for those now that are uh, ministering to Ukrainian refugees, that you would give them special grace uh, to preach your gospel at this time in their uh, giving of comfort. Lord, we pray that you would send messengers to the Jews. Oh God, how long until that promised time that you bring them back? But Lord, we see we are in need of being brought back. Lord, return us to yourselves. Revive your church, O oh God. We, uh, we pray that you would uh, bless us to love one another, to um, encourage one another to love and to good works, that you would bless us in our families to be husbands who love sacrificially as uh, Christ has his church, to be wives who submit to their uh, husbands, children who obey their parents, Lord, parents who consecrate their children in the teaching of your word. Oh, Lord God, we, we do give you praise. We ask, oh God, that uh, you would bless us uh, day by day, bless us this day with what we need, our bread this day, our covering. You have said, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. And Lord, we, we fear that uh, we are so enriched that we would not be content just with food and covering. We know that it is a, of your goodness that you give us plenty. We pray that we would not let it turn to rot by using it idolatrously, but that rather we will be generous with those in need, that you will receive our acknowledgement that you own all of our stuff in receiving the tithe. We pray, O oh God, that uh, you will bless us uh, with sleep and rest and recuperation of body day by day, that you would grant healing, Lord, to uh, Buddy, to Dave Lassard, to Miriam Woodyard, to my mom, to uh, Sue Green, to Mickey Park. Lord, thank you for your uh, blessing and help for her. We uh, pray uh, for uh, my sister Liz and, and Don, as well as uh, uh, Mickey uh, <clears throat> uh, with tinnitus and, and pray for healing. We pray for Michelle and Will Platt, oh God. We pray for Melissa. Thank you for her being able to be here today. And we pray your continued uh, healing and watching over her. Uh, we, we pray, oh God, that you would bless Addison more with healing from her eating disorder. Lord God, we pray for Abigail. Lord, strengthen her, we pray. We, we pray for Franco, and we pray, oh God, that you would heal him in body and spirit. Lord, we pray for uh, Carol Smith to heal from neck surgery, for Chris Hatton, Lord, for your salvation in his life, for Rich and Maddie Ellis, that their house will uh, close on time, that uh, you will bless um, our uh, missionaries, uh, Sam and Hope, that are taking our donation to help uh, the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian refugees. We pray, Lord, for healing for Donnie Hauska and Cody Little, for K. Dean Ham, for Missy Brock, for Bobby Brock, for his cancer. Oh God, we pray for Aaron Overdeer. We do pray, oh God, for our unsaved family members and give us that wisdom that we pray generally towards them, that we would walk in wisdom toward them, redeeming the time, our uh, speech always in grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how to answer them in particular. We pray for Tony and Sharon, uh, Sharon Manillo and pray for peace and comfort during his cancer treatment. Uh, Lord, uh, we uh, pray your blessing on our uh, baptism today. Pray your blessing on our reception, Lord of the Palmers as members. We ask, O oh God, now um, 
that you would forgive us of our debts where our sins have indebted us, where we have not kept your commands. We confess the, the blood of Christ as our only covering. And we pray, Lord, that as those uh, forgiven, that we will know that uh, we must forgive others and that we will seek the signs of forgiveness in us, that we do not plot revenge, that we do not speak ill of them, and we do not uh, let, the, let ourselves dwell on these things. We pray, Lord, that we will uh, renew this commitment day by day if needed. Lord God, don't lead us into temptation then, the temptation of bitterness and unforgiveness or any temptation. Lord, uh, we know, Lord, you do not cause temptation, that it comes from our own desires. We pray that you would deliver us from them and from uh, Satan being able to use them by pointing them out to us, O oh God, that in your grace you would show us and uh, show us where um, we are idolaters or uh, where we are those who hate our uh, brother, our neighbor in any way. Show us, O oh God. Thank you for your word and its natural power of conviction to convict us of sin. May you so work powerfully in us uh, to bring us humbly before you. And uh, these things we ask in the blessed name of Christ. Amen. guys would please join me in the reading of God's word today. We are in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11 verses uh, chapter 11 verse 22 through chapter 12 verse 10. Get my bearings here. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as, the, as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, so encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly uh, many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the, for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall, uh, shall surely die and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then, David said, or then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? 
You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would bless Pastor Cain in this message he's prepared for us, Lord. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word. And as always, Lord, please teach us to not just be hearers of your word, but doers also. Amen. And uh, if uh, the Palmers can, uh, can come up, is that a, we're going to try and make this do over here. Palmers have expressed a desire to become uh, members here, and uh, so we've uh, talked with them and uh, confirmed their um, love of the Lord, and, um, and this basically then is uh, just a prayer of mutual commitment, and receiving them as members is just saying, recognizing their desire to be committed to us, and then simply saying, and we uh, reciprocate that we are going to be committed to you so that we will be faithful to one another. And so let's uh, pray that prayer of commitment. Lord God, um, thank you for your great work in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, local churches, local bodies of believers to serve you. And we pray that you would help us to serve you together here. And we thank you, Lord, for the Palmer's desire to uh, throw in their lot with us and to strive together for your gospel. Pray your blessing on them in every way, O God. We all need your spirit. Supply it plentifully to them and let them uh, believe that you will give it. And I pray, Lord, now that uh, you would bless us in our ministry to the Palmers and our faithfulness to them, Lord. And we uh, uh, pray that you would bless them in ministering to us that we would all exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest we be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Lord, we love you and praise you in, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, be careful. Thank you, Good morning, and um, Colossians 3.16 says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Since I'm taking such a long time to find it, I think I'm starting it out right there. Uh, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, parallel to Ephesians 5.19. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dwell in you and dwell in you in a flourishing manner. Not just that it's there and that it's alive, but that it's overflowing. Uh, may God grant that that would be our relationship to his word. Amen. All right. And our uh, second Sunday of the month sermon series through the life of David brings us today to the end of chapter 11 and going into chapter 12.
And here we'll see that David uh, is going to think that he has succeeded in his plotting, but God will lay him low with just the simple truth that David had suppressed. Creatures who can completely deny reality, which is where David is right here in the story, should always be on the lookout for spiritual hazards. We need the mirror of the Word, and we'll talk about that more today. Let's pray. Lord God, teach us your words. Grant them to enter us and remain in us. Grant that the Word will be a mirror for us, and that the, the things that you need us to see that we don't like, that we would receive, knowing your love and showing us that you did not save us because we were okay. You saved us because we weren't okay, because we needed changing. Thank you for your commitment to change us and your power to do so. Lord, let us trust in it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Samuel 11:26. And Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, and she mourned for her Lord. And if you go in the, uh, the outline to the, to the next page, um, after the first page, and uh, see that um, G on the, that next page in 2 Samuel 11, the battle with Ammon was resumed. David stayed in Jerusalem, but he had done that in the previous chapter as well, so we don't know how much blame we want to attach on that, him staying behind. But in Jerusalem at nightfall from his roof, he saw beautiful Bathsheba washing herself, presumably in her courtyard. He inquired concerning her, and God gave him warnings to leave her alone. Isn't this uh, Bathsheba the wife of Uriah? So the messenger was trying to, you know, hint him in, you know, if you've got uh, more than a healthy curiosity about her, uh, you need to probably lay it aside. She was married to one of his chief military officers and daughter to another one of them. But David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba, like David, had been holy up to this point. Bathsheba conceived, and David started looking to cover his tracks. He fetched Uriah from the battlefront where he was, hoping that Uriah would go home and lay with his wife, and then that would be, okay, yeah, you're the one who got her pregnant. Uriah refused the comforts of home. God said, I'm not going to let you have this out, David. And so Uriah stays away from his house. David sent word to Joab to plan an attack where Uriah would be killed, and that was accomplished. And we saw that elaborate back and forth of the message to Joab, the message back, the message given to the messenger, and then the message as it was relayed to David. We looked at that last time. Kids speak. Kids, whom did David have killed last time we looked at his story? Uriah, good the husband of the woman David had committed adultery with, the woman he had laid with. By the way, I, I have a, um, a messianic flow sheet as a, one of the little half sheets in your bulletin there. Um, I, I forgot what chapter I was listening to a recording of and made me uh, think of you know just one um, kind of a one sentence thought of how David was like the Messiah in that chapter. So I won't go into that sheet, but you have it there. And of course, when you get up to chapter 11, then you're like, well, he's not acting like the Messiah in this chapter. And so probably uh, the um, the flow could could be revised to go back to 1 Samuel 25 and actually say, as we said then, that Abigail was the main type of Christ in that chapter. Who's the main type of Christ in this chapter? It's Uriah. So, uh, as far as an outline, first of all, it can look like we got away with it. But everything hinges on the one steadfastly just opinion. Everything hinges on the way God looks at things. There are many mirrors in life. Most make us mad including if we're willing to be mirrors for one another and say, are, are you sure you're doing this right? What's our first response if somebody says that, however gently? Huh? 
How dare you? Every sin is a betrayal against God's great ge generosity. So, again, our uh, verse uh, that we're beginning with today, 2 Samuel eleven twenty six. And Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah was dead, and she mourned for her Lord. Bathsheba, you notice, is not the focus, doesn't even name her. Here she is, the wife of Uriah. He's the hero. David and Bathsheba did wrong, David more so. But Uriah is the upright one in this chapter. The upright was slain for the wrongdoer's wrongdoing. Very much a, a type of Christ. But again, chiefly David's wrongdoing. So the wife of Uriah heard that her husband Uriah was dead. Since David does not seem to have returned word to Bathsheba since she sent him word of her pregnancy, this was probably her first good lead on what David had done. Okay, my husband's dead. Okay, yeah, and I committed adultery with David. David's the commander. So, we're, again, we're assuming she hadn't heard anything until this. And Uriah's death was a very unlikely coincidence. It sounds like Bathsheba heard through regular channels like any other officer's wife or probably just any other soldier's uh, wife would hear if they had died. And she mourned for her Lord. Lord, not the usual word for, for husband, which is just uh, ish, the word for a man, but not uncommon. The biblical roles of husband and wife as Lord and second in command. Notice I didn't say Lord and servant. Lord and second in command. And that's the way it was originally, right? It says uh, He says, I will make a help suitable to you, a, a helping counterpart. That's the second in command. That's clear from the word Lord. A godly husband is to love his wife, not coerce her submission. And her command is to submit. If she doesn't do it, that's on her. The husband can't say, I will make you submit. I mean, that's, that's up to her. If she wants to disobey, that's on her. Now, of course, uh, you know, he will uh, be seeking grace from God to be able to impose godliness in his house where it's not voluntary, but he can only go so far which is why you want to choose a good husband, wife in the first place, right? So uh, she is mourning, she is uh, grieving. That's the fifth time that we've had this word in the first and second Samuel saga. The first two for Samuel's death. The, the next one for Saul, right at the beginning of second Samuel. The next one was David telling Joab, you will mourn for Abner whom you killed. Remember that? And lastly, this one. This is the last one in uh, these two books. The word connotes the deep expression of emotion, yeah, even sort of connotes uh, or denotes a beating of the breast. Bathsheba's mourning must have been particularly conscience-stricken, though, because um, she's saying, hey, you know, I had something to do with this, with his death. David was too enmeshed in his plotting to let conscience bother him. Kids speak. Kids, what did Bathsheba do when her husband died? Well, she spent maybe a, a month, and that's how long they mourned for Moses and Aaron's deaths, by the way. Um, maybe longer, though, for her husband. Doing things to remember her husband and to be sad about him dying. Usually um, in our culture, well, I say probably not anymore, but it used to be you could tell if somebody went around wearing black, that would say that they were in mourning. Uh, it's not so much of a popular thing anymore. But she was probably really sorry because she thought, oh, I probably was partly to blame for him dying. 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven, 27, And the grieving period passed over. Then David sent and gathered her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore a son to him. But the act that David had committed was wrongly done in the eyes of Yahweh. So this grieving is a uh, different word than the one in the previous verse, just a, a synonym. Uh, pass over, very common Hebrew word, usually of uh, physical movement, of passing over from this region to that region. 
So this is a less us usual usage for passing over. But so is its next occurrence. The next time we see this word for passing over, it's when Nathan will tell God that God has passed over his sin. Just a little bit more into chapter 12. Well, this grieving uh, refers to Bathsheba. She fully observed the proper time of mourning for her husband. The chronicler has revealed her general holiness before this slip. And so back in verse 4, the, the, the priestly language that we have of her in, in 2 Samuel 11, 4, uh, told us that, that she didn't just cleanse herself from her impurity, she consecrated herself from it. This period of grieving indicates that she had resumed her God-centered frame of mind as much as she could uh, with maybe a, a guilty conscience. Presumably, she had no knowledge of what would happen to her next. You know, again, we don't have any indication that David had told her what he would do in the meantime. She probably had worked out in her mind whether or not people would question her pregnancy being from Uriah. She likely accepted this contingency. So, of course, David wasn't very nice not to communicate with her and give her any assurances. Maybe he did, but it doesn't look like it. Just left her to, you know, thrash about on her own. But then David sent and gathered her to his house. Contrasted to the last time back in chapter 4, of verse 11, where he sent and took her. <laughs> We recall sent being a prevalent theme at the beginning of the chapter. This sent in this verse provides some resolution to the troubling sendings earlier. The next will be Yahweh sending Nathan to David, right in chapter 12, verse 1. It says he gathered her to his house. If you look up the word gathered, you see, a, yeah, it's usually a word of comfort, of gathering someone in to protect them. David took her from her bereavement and gave her a home. That was making the best of the wrong he had done. And she became his wife. Another wife added to the six plus that he had. And we, we actually had a, were able to count up to six, but there's more than that, um, as we'll actually talk about again. She will become the queen mother because she's going to bear Solomon next, right? She will become the queen mother we wished Abigail could have been. Remember that when we talked about Abigail, we're saying that would have been the one right there. But she will be it. And not to say that she would uh, necessarily be um, inferior, but the chronicler, you know, focused us in on Abigail saying, you know, uh, she is uh, the kind of, of a mother you would want for a, to raise up a king from her household. Kids speak. Kids, David did very wrong to lay with Bathsheba and to kill Uriah, but he did right to marry Bathsheba so he could make sure that she and the baby were okay. All right, so here we go. And she bore a son to him, so about nine months have passed since the original incident. Uriah being a Hittite, David was not under obligation to raise an heir to Uriah. He had been Nabal's kinsman redeemer, so he was available to do that for um, Nabal in marrying Abigail. But that is also why Abigail could uh, not have children that would go to the throne, because they would be in Nabal's household. So it looked to all appearances that David had gotten away with it. In fact, he looked noble. Well, look at him. He's taking in, you know, protecting one of his fallen soldiers, you know, assuming that word hadn't gotten out. And, you know, these, uh, the servants around him, I'm sure, were well trained and tight lipped. But the act that David had committed was wrongly done in Yahweh's eyes. And that's, that's where we have a bit of the implication that he was starting to maybe look good outwardly, but no. He had done wrong to God. A final summation and verdict. Despite things looking like they might have worked out for David, God was not having it. But God hadn't been in a hurry to pass sentence. It's like, all right, we'll let this come to fruition. We'll let the child be born. The word wrongly done is the verb form of the noun for something ill done or spoiled, a very common word for evil in the Old Testament. 
highlighting, the word highlights the damaging effects of sin. But here it is ill done in Yahweh's eyes, as all sin ultimately is sin in reference to God. Meaning that even though David had made the best of his mess by bringing Bathsheba into his protection, his sins had not been extricated by that. His sins had not been ameliorated. The act David had committed sees David's two big sins as one. He murdered to cover adultery. The, it names singular the thing that he had done. So both of them together, we could probably throw in his pride now that he's thinking, hmm, I got away with it. Have a son and a new wife I like. Remember, God would be a, for, a poor father to simply overlook our misdeeds. When we start reading in chapter 12, uh, his uh, pronouncements on David, it's heavy. As we will see in uh, 12, and I forgot to put the uh, verses in there, uh, the verse in there, let's look, let's look at it together. So 2 Samuel uh, 12, and uh, you can see where Nathan is talking to him. And when David finally confesses in verse 13 of chapter 12, I've sinned against Yahweh, Nathan said, Yahweh also has put away your sin. You shall not die, which you should have. However, because this deed you have, uh, by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of Yahweh to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. And that's after he's told him that the sword will not depart from his house in the, the verses before that. So um, a heavy um, punishment for that sin. So God can forgive us and exact consequences as well. He can do both, forgive and ex exact consequences. Again, doing both is part of his fatherly faithfulness. Kids speak. Kids, David probably thought he got away with everything like he planned, but did he? No. Didn't get away with it, did he? 2 Samuel 12, 1, And Yahweh sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other uh, poor, or the one rich and the one poor, literally. So, story time. If you have a prophet coming to you and he leads off with a story, you should be like, uh-oh, <laughs> what's he getting at? But he gains David's interest. Nathan already knows what the story means, so he's not telling a story and then waiting to know what it means. He knows already. We can see from verse 7. God always sends to bring his people back. He sends you and me. Galatians 6.1, you who are spiritual, if, if someone strays, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, looking to yourselves, lest you be tempted. James 5.19 and 20, if anyone brings back a sinner from the error of his ways, let him know that he's covering a multitude of sins. And 1 John 5, 16 and 17, we have anything we ask. If we even ask for a brother who is sinning a sin not to death, God promises to bring him back. And of course, you hook that one up with the James, which would include, then you pray for him and you go get him. You go say, brother, turn around, come back to the Lord. So... The story, a rich man and a poor man, our barometer is already set for an injustice, right? Because that's what we see in life. When we see rich man, poor man together, if the rich man's not helping the poor man, we usually think, okay, how's he hurting him? Because that's usually what's happening. The uh, Bible is cynical towards rich people. We've seen it in our study of Luke. Blessed are you poor Matthew is poor in spirit. Luke is just poor. And then in Luke, it's woe to you rich or woe to the rich. Bam, just like that. So, I mean, you've already got a strike against you if you if you have more than enough, which is most of us, isn't it? I mean, in a blessed nation, you have to hear that. You have to hear that word. It says, I've got counts against me that I'm going to have to find a way to offset 
James 2, 6 and 7, isn't it the rich who oppress you, he tells his audience, drag you into court? Dependence on God is just very hard when you always have more than enough. You know, if you have any sense, you know that. You know, if, if you hadn't thought about it, you need to think about it. You need to just understand that. You know, it's, Lord, give us our daily bread, but you're not praying that the same as somebody who's plowing the field, and that's all he's got. You know, that's a completely different prayer. Of course, it's helping us now that uh, our, our supply chain is kind of broken down, and so sometimes we are a little worried. Huh? That's, that's helpful spiritually, unfortunately. It's hard to simulate the dependence a poor man knows. No mere agreement that all our stuff belongs to God can get us where we need to get. You can agree 100%. Yes, I know God, it all came from you. But there's just nothing like a rumbling belly to set your prayers in the, in the right mode towards God. Regular generosity to the poor is an essential lifeline for the rich. Matthew 6, 2, when you do mercies, merciful deeds to the poor. Hebrews 13, 16, the do the sacrifice of helping those, of being generous, of giving. And in 1 Timothy 6, I didn't put in here, where he, uh, he says, command the rich that they be generous, that they give, laying up a... A, a storehouse in heaven. Second Samuel 12, 2. The rich one, so the story continues, had very abundant sheep and cattle, but the poor one had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and preserved, and it grew up with him and with his sons together, and it ate from his own portion, his own morsel, and it drank from his cup, and it lay down in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Come on now, that's funny. You know, you, you're picturing that and they, saying, well, I don't know, Arnold the pig, he, you know, if you ever watch Green Acres, but you know, here's a, here's a little lamb that's, you know, more like a little, you know, Yorkie dog or something. Uh, but even, I'm saying it's even funny, you know, with a, with a Yorkie, if you're letting it drink out of your cup and, you know, giving it nibbles off of your, your uh, bread. A longer description for the lesser possessions and vice versa. So the rich man, he just had lots of stuff, but the poor man, he had this and it was like this and he treated it like this and so did his whole family, a long description. Because the rich man's stuff was ad nauseum. But we dote on every detail of the poor man's one item, just as he did. So the story helps us to do that. The rich and the poor man have one thing in common. Each one owns sheep, but the poor man only owns one. The poor man's little lamb is like a family member, even like a daughter to him, it says. And what the family goes through, the sheep goes through. What the poor man ate and drank, the little lamb partook. We note that tender care for animals is not frowned on in Scripture. They have souls. Did you know that? Um, Genesis 124, many Scriptures. And the translations all say, you know, God made living beings or something like that. Or, but it's the word soul, nephesh, the same word for your soul, the same word ascribed to God for having a soul. Animals have souls. Now, whether they have spirits or not, is, a, is another thing, but they're not made in the image of God. That's the main thing, isn't it? But still, they have souls. And Proverbs tells us, you know, blessed is the man who cares for his animals. 2 Samuel 12, 4. Story continues. We got this rich man, this poor man, and a traveler came to the rich one, and he was diffident about uh, taking from his own sheep and from his own cattle to prepare for the trekker who had come to him. And he took the ewe lamb of the poor man and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So traveler, based on a word, just a regular word for walk in Hebrew. Trekker is based on the word for highway. So the idea is that the rich man was willing to sacrifice the poor man's sheep for a relative stranger, somebody coming in off the road, the man coming to him. Uh, diffident that, that we have, there's actually pity that he had pity on his own flocks. He's looking out there, oh, I don't want to kill one of them. Uh, lessen my number by one. He took the poor man's little lamb as David took, same word, Bathsheba, back in 11.4. 
Kids speak. Kids, God sent Nathan to David to tell him a story. A poor man had one sweet little lamb that his whole family loved. A rich man had plenty of sheep, but he took the poor man's sheep to make dinner for a guest. Wow, that was wrong. So where do you think this story is going? It's interesting, huh? 12.5, and David's anger glowed intensely towards the man. And he said to Nathan, Yahweh is alive, that, that the man who did this is a son of death. And he shall repay four times the amount for the ewe lamb, seeing that he did this thing, and based on his lack of pity. And David's all worked up over this story, even knowing it's not real. He's still boiling. That's how conscience works. Romans 2.1, you who judge another, condemn yourself. For when you judge another, you do the same thing. It's the same word for pity David uses as in the previous verse. The man did have pity on his own stuff. Yeah, well, David had pity on his own reputation, didn't he? He had pity, you know, I want to look good. I mean, I've got to do something about this so I don't look bad. By the way, I, um, you, you might be thinking here of the, uh, the gourd in the Jonah story that he, uh, God told Jonah, you had pity on the gourd. It is a different word, but uh, it's a synonym, so there is a similarity there. Fourfold, he should pay back four times as much. Well, guess what? That's right out of the law. That's right out of Exodus 22.1. If a sheep is stolen, he has to pay back four sheep. So David's like, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much stealing what he did. So David hadn't forgotten his Bible, just as keen as ever, but now it serves his sense of justice. He's probably not remembering, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. He's a son of death, literally, which, interestingly, the only other time that phrase is used is when Saul said it about David talking to Jonathan. It says that, you know, bring him to me, and he's a son, you know, son of death. In other words, I'll get rid of him. He's as good as dead, a walking dead man. So, yeah, David walked right into that when he, the story, and he's just like, what? Pronounced his own just sentence. He's a son of death. Because adultery normally incurred capital punishment. But Yahweh will forego that sentence, and we'll have to discuss that more, more fully when we read God's sentence, but he, he doesn't let David off the hook. Kids speak, kids. David was super mad when he heard the story. That guy ought to die. And now verse 7 and 8, finishing our text today. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. You ever heard that before? Has anybody ever quoted that before? That's a very popular sermonic quotation. You are the man. So says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I myself anointed you as king over Israel. And I, and it should say I myself rescued you. I forgot to amend that. So it's the same thing. It's the verb with the added pronoun. So I myself rescued you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you the house of your master and your master's wives into your bosom. And I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that were too little, then I would have added to you according to these and those things. So you are the man. You're the man in the story, David. The man you're mad at, you're the man. This quote talks about God's ability, Scripture's ability to bring out a negative reaction when holding a mirror up to us. That's James 1, isn't it? James 1 says that God's Word is like a mirror that we look into. We are well advised to beat any Nathan in life to the punch by taking this accusation, you are the man, with us to Scripture and prayer. Whenever we come to Scripture, whenever we come to prayer, Lord, show me how I am the man. You took... Uh, the, the, your master's wives into your bosom as Bathsheba had been to Uriah in the story. It's the lamb that's in, your, in the, uh, the poor man's bosom, but that's the, the likeness is to Bathsheba, right? That Uriah loved his, his one wife, was dear to him. 
David had Michal. Remember, he married Saul's daughter. Of course, then he took her from him. Then he got her back. Um, but he, So he did have his master's wives. But back in chapter 5 of this book, in verse 13, it says, and he married other women and doesn't name them. So from this, we would, I think, uh, assume that that included more of Saul's wives. So all of God's help in escaping Saul, he recounts, all of the transfer of power, king over Judah, then Israel, and it was not enough. Wasn't enough for David. How easily ingratitude consumes us. I mean, when we take the Lord's Supper every week, I mean, that should last us one week of saying, what more could God have given me? How can I be wanting some sin? And God's generosity was a hand held out. He says, I would have given you more. I wouldn't, I wouldn't finish giving you stuff. I would have given you pretty much whatever you wanted. Until this. Still, God will be gracious in dispensing justice. Kids speak. Kids, the man in the story, the, the rich man who did the wrong thing that David was so mad at, who was it really? David. It was David. Usually, listen to this, when we're really mad, it's usually because of something we did. You'll find that out if you haven't already. So how does all this relate to Christ? Well, God anointed David. I myself anointed you in this last verse, changing the monarchy from Saul's house. His Saul's sons were, were not going to get to reign because of what Saul did. David acted ungratefully. So now, by contrast, the anointed one, Christ, was grateful and was faithful to his father's house to the end. May we imbibe his faithfulness. When we're looking to him, may we draw from that faithfulness. For the walking wounded, because Paul tells us to uphold the strengthless, there is no personal weakness worse than direct decisions against God. So if you can avoid that, you're, you're not totally crippled. All right, all Scripture is profitable for teaching, for conviction. Do I read Scriptures to hear, you are the man? That's what they're for, right? To say, you are the man. All Scriptures are profitable after conviction for correction, for realignment. I will ask the Spirit to generally, continually sensitize my conscience that I may walk humbly. I may know I am the man. I'm somebody who has been uh, rescued by, by grace. I was a sinner deserving of death, and I can still feel that old man in me. And all Scripture is profitable for schooling in righteousness. Lord, how easily the best of us can fall. Uphold me. And when we, you know use the Lord's outline for prayer, and we come to, don't lead, uh, lead us into temptation, deliver us, uphold me. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, the one thinking he stands must look lest he fall. Usually translated, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. David thought he had gotten back on solid ground. God showed him otherwise. But how can God restore our sight when we have blinded ourselves. You know, he had a, there was a prophet from God who God said, you go tell David this. Okay, well, you know, how, do, how do we get told? Listen, very important here. You know, this is one of the things where we would think, you know, well, yeah, I'd rather have Jesus here with me now. But what did Jesus say? I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to send you my spirit. Jesus said it was advantageous. So, while well, I don't have a prophet who can, you know, get a direct word and get it to me, listen, after Christ's death, there is an unusual measure of God's personal power present to help us through the simple, faithful ministry of the word. This right here, right now. 
This is the main way God intends to speak to us, me included. And it's going to do you less good if I don't see that for myself, if the word doesn't hit me first, I, because, I, because I'll be, you know, preaching down to you. Exhort one another daily, so exhort one another, our, your, your exhortations to each other and to me largely flows from that same word. We've all heard this word together, haven't we? And it will become a basis for our exhorting one another daily. Not, a, not the sole one, but certainly an important one. The mature Christian picks up his own Bible to see and able to see his sin that he may be realigned, convicted that he may be realigned. The two things we just read, the prophets of the word to us, the, the uh, advantages of the word to us. Let's pray. Lord, mature us, make us grow, that we would be those who come to your word seeking conviction because we know how uh, tricky the old man is. We know how tricky Satan is and how easily we deceive ourselves. But you are well able to hold us up, Lord. Let us always be looking into the light because we are always looking to the Lord Jesus who is the light of the word, world. And we ask it in his name. Amen. And let's turn in closing to number 525 in the red hymnal, a child of the king. And let us confess our privilege to encourage ourselves with singing 525 in the red hymnal, a child of the king, and let's stand as we sing. I'm a 
a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Amen. And you may be seated. And we come to the Lord's table. doohickey up there. We're, we're getting close. We'll be able to uh, not have to say, where is that in the book? I can't find it. We'll have it up there. Or up there. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the one who is anointed, who did not fail. We needed a, a man to be our representative who was righteous and who could give us as a gift that righteousness, to impute it, to put it on our account. And we thank you that in your body you did not sin, that in your mind, that in your eyes, all that you did, you never sinned. And so you were, as we've been talking about a lamb, that you were that different kind of lamb, the sacrificial lamb the, that had to be spotless. And so you were without the spot of sin. And we thank you, Father, for receiving his sacrifice and proving it by raising him from the dead. And so we give you praise and honor, Lord Jesus, and pray that as we partake this bread that we will know that you are our brother, that you have bonded us to yourself by your death, and you will not let us go. So encourage your people. Amen. Lord Jesus, we, we do ask ourselves, why, why would you do this for us? Why would you love us this way? We pray that we would have faith to believe that you have loved us. And then, as the apostle says, that the love of Christ con constrains us that in everything. Your love will be our banner. Lord, teach us this. We know it is a matter of faith, and we are little faiths. Lord, send your Spirit to revive us, that our heart might be large, that you might, might dwell in our hearts by faith, and we might comprehend 
the uh, height and depth and width and length and to know and experience your love that surpasses uh, mere mental comprehension. And we ask this to the glory and honor of your name. Amen. Now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make us complete in every good work to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing before him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And you are dismissed. And we have some... Uh, extra Jehovah is my shepherd I shall not lack He lays me down in pastures of grass He guides me to waters of rest My soul He restores He guides me in paths Of righteousness for His name's sake He guides me in Paths of righteousness. When I am walking in the valley of death's shadow, I will not fear evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You situate a table before my face, directly before my foes. My head you anoint with oil. My cup is plenteous. Surely good and grace will
Self.